Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. If there's one thing we've learned when filming Wild Kingdom, it's that nature can be harsh. Not all animals are strong and healthy enough to survive. In tonight's episode, we'll explore the relationship between predator and prey. Each plays an important role in keeping animal populations in check. The old and the sickly animals are naturally weeded out, leaving the strong and the healthy to produce the next generation. In fact, predators are only successful about 50% of their attempts to catch food. This reality can seem harsh, but it's absolutely necessary to create that delicate yet natural balance of the animals in the wild kingdom. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Call him Puma. Call him Cougar. Call him Painter or Panther. Call him Catamount or Mountain Lion. By any name, he is North America's King of Beasts. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Hello, welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. You know, when most people think of the big cats, they think of lions and tigers, and maybe jaguars. But very few think of our own homegrown cat, the puma. Jim, this little puma seems to be in a pretty playful mood. Let's try him out with a fuzzy toy. There you go. <laughs> I'm not so sure that's all play. I'm not there sure you. it is either. Look at him go there. Already at three months of age, he's showing traits that are, will characterize his behavior as an adult, mostly that of a hunter. He's getting good practice now for the day when he'll really be serious. Say, Jim, do you know who was the first man to write about the puma? First one? No. I'll tell you. It was Christopher Columbus. Because when he came over here, the puma had a great range over most of North America, clear down through Central America to South America, as far south as Patagonia. When the settlers first came into North America and started building their farms, they found the puma common, but they had to eliminate him because of their cattle and their other animals. So until today, the puma is only found in a few isolated pockets, mostly in that hard to get to port portion of the mountains of the West. And that's where Jim and I went to study him, at a place we call Puma Pass. It was beautiful country, real wilderness, just an ideal place to pitch camp and set up blinds to study and photograph the animals passing through. Although adult pumas travel mostly by night, we found that the younger ones do a great deal of exploring by daylight. I don't know whether this handsome fellow saw me, but I'm pretty sure it was my trail he sent it in that brush. The puma is the dominant animal here. Each mature male establishes himself as ruler of a specific territory, the boundaries of which are well known to him and to other pumas. This fellow is only about nine months old, but already he moves with the assurance of an adult, sure-footed, graceful, powerful muscles rippling beneath his tawny fur, his entire body is vibrant with latent energy. The puma is master here and all the animals know it. A young puma questions everything and the porcupine is ready with 30,000 answers. That's how many quills it has, all needle sharp. Wheeling around to face away from the aggressor, the porcupine swats with its club-like spiny tail, aiming for the face. If it ever connects, one puma will learn a lesson long remembered. It's pretty confusing to the young puma. Perhaps if the porcupine climbs up this fallen tree, the cat will go away. With its characteristic shuffle, the porcupine moves along. Of course, the puma could climb up, 
But that wouldn't get him around those bristling barbs. There's nothing to do but to move on. And around those rocks, there's another surprise waiting for him. In these parts, a fellow really has to look where he's walking. In a mountain meadow, I was watching two young mule deer at play one day when I chanced to witness a rare example of animal courage. Against the puma, deer are pretty defenseless. Immediately sensing the grave danger, the doe ran off to head the puma away from her fawn. The puma followed. The chase led into a narrow ravine. And just as the puma was closing in, the doe turned on him. Here the tables were really turned. A puma driven off by a deer. A deer brave enough to face death to protect her young. The mother puma is equally protective of her young and spends much of her time hunting food for them. She's after a rabbit. The rabbit will be relished by her kittens when they wake up from their nap. Puma kittens are strictly mother's concern. Father takes no part in raising them. A few weeks after birth, the kittens are ready to leave the den and explore the world around them. Curious, but unsure of themselves, they stay close together and seem to enjoy playing follow the leader. Two kittens come home. What happened to the third? That's what mother wants to know. A young kitten like this, off by itself, would be easy prey for a number of predators in the area. Mother won't rest till she finds him. A few gentle licks of assurance and affection, then mother gives him a ride home that should serve as a strong reminder he's not to go off again. Down by the creek, a young raccoon was nosing about at the water's edge. Right from birth, raccoons wear this black mask, which is their most distinctive feature. But along came the puma, and the raccoon's curiosity naturally changed to fright. The puma must not have seen him, but the raccoon knew instinctively that he was in danger. An instinct forces him to climb whenever danger threatens. I got there just in time to get him out of trouble and found that he was just the right age to take back to camp as a pet. At the same time, as it turned out, I'd come upon a young porcupine on a small island in the stream. Now, porcupines are perfectly good swimmers, but this youngster seemed afraid to get his feet wet. So I built him a bridge. Luckily, he learned his climbing lessons better than his swimming lessons. So there was Jim with the little raccoon and I with the young porcupine. We couldn't provide the exact formulas our adopted children had been raised on, but neither of these animals is finicky about its diet, and cow's milk seemed just as good as mother's. The little porcupine deserted us and went back into the wild, but as you can see, the little raccoon accepted us all right. He even came home with us. At his age, he needs quite a bit of care, as do most young animals. If this little puma didn't live in the zoo and he lost his mother, he'd be in trouble. Yes, he sure would. An animal's instinct to protect himself and his family is one of the most interesting facets of the wild kingdom. Well, Jim, in their own way, animals do try to make plans. Remember that mother deer? 
Her plan was to decoy the puma away from her fawn and thereby protect him. But her plan failed, and instinct demanded that she do everything she could for her fawn's safety. That's why she turned on the puma. That little raccoon reminds me of the fact that one of the most interesting things about camping out in a wilderness area is that while we're satisfying our curiosity about the animals, they're satisfying their curiosity about us, particularly our food supply. Before long, we had several pets in camp, one of which was a tame crow. He'd perch on our tent and fuss at us till we fed him, then thank us for trying to take fingers and all. Another pet was a cute little golden mantle ground squirrel who found my binocular strap most pleasing to chew on. A hoary marmot favored our knapsacks, where I'm sure he found all sorts of intriguing smells and flavors. Our nearest neighbor was a pine marten, and a rare one, an albino. Normally, the fur is grayish brown. Like his cousin, the weasel, he's an aggressive hunter, but it seems our visits always made him quite nervous. While we were out investigating the wildlife of the region, it seems the pumas were investigating us. We caught them several times nosing around our camp, making themselves right at home. The young one was here with its mother, but she kept to the shelter of the rocks. My camera was just inside the tent. I hoped I could get it out without spooking them. The young one posed beautifully and so I was able to get a truly fine portrait of the magnificent American King of Beasts. And just in time, he left to catch up with his mother, for that day she had him out teaching him to hunt. One of her favorite hunting grounds was a boulder in the center of a narrow ravine from which she could spot any animal passing below. This is the same ravine where I saw the deer turn on the puma. But this day, with Mother Puma on the boulder and her youngster down in the ravine, we witnessed the much more usual business, in fact, the entirely necessary business of the Puma killing in order to survive. Suddenly, the deer sense danger. Speed is their only defense, and one of the deer succeeds in escaping the narrow confines of the ravine. The wise old cat is content to patiently wait the opportunity to strike while the inexperienced youngster gives chase. The young cat has lost his quarry. To him, it was mostly a game. Now mother senses the time has come. Every nerve, every muscle ready for the attack. Puma kills not for sport, but to survive. Playful now, the young one will learn to do as mother's doing, cover a carcass, and when hungry, return to it rather than go after fresh game. Mountain timber is the favorite summering ground of the American elk, which the Shawnee Indians named Wapiti. The great bull elk with his antlered crown is surely one of the most majestic of all animals. Young elk, fun and frolic. We saw puma kittens playing follow the leader. Well, these little calves seem to be playing tag. A mature bull elk maintains a harem of 12 to 50 cows. He spends much of his time keeping them herded together so he can ward off encroachment by younger bulls. To establish and maintain a harem, a bull must fight and digging up turf seems to be one way of staying in fighting trim. 
While the pumas were away from the deer carcass, a badger dug in and claimed it for his own. I suppose this is only natural. Badgers also bury carcasses. But like many other animals, he's quite happy to feast in the puma's pantry. You wouldn't expect the pumas to take this lightly, and they don't. Even the young puma knows that this isn't to be tolerated. What he doesn't know yet is that the badger is one of the scrappiest, most determined fighters in the wild kingdom. This encounter calls to mind how in times past, men used to set dogs on badgers just for sport. And that so-called sport was the source of our expression to badger someone. The young puma is learning that while he has little to fear from any animal in Puma Pass, there are some that have no fear of him and that he might just as well leave them alone. We were interested to discover that a coyote's territory overlapped the pumas. Both mother and father coyote provide for their young. And while they were off hunting, we found their pups engaged in a grand free-for-all with, of all things, a young puma. This could only happen with young animals. When they're a few months old, pups start joining their parents in the hunt and fighting among themselves over the catch. You know, Marlon, even though the coyote does have a bad reputation, I would sure hate to see him leave the western scene. I would too, Jim. Jim, of all the predators in the west, which do you think is the most popular? Well, I suppose different people have different favorites, but from the way people act when they visit the parks, I expect it would be the bear. I expect you're right. And of course, Puma Pass had its quota of bears, too. Twins are the normal pattern of bear reproduction, and I guess it's a pretty happy arrangement since two's company and three's a crowd. Like Mother Puma, Mama Bear rears the children with no help from Papa, despite what you've read in the story of Goldilocks. She feeds them, protects them, and teaches them all sorts of valuable tricks, such as turning over a rock to uncover lizards and grubs and other delicious tidbits. At times, though, Mother leaves them on their own. How else could they develop self-reliance? The world is wide, there's much to see, and a fellow can see better standing up. This may be their first sight of a puma, Anyway, it's something to investigate. Looks as though this could also be the puma's first encounter with bears. Maybe they can play together. But no, there seems to be an instinctive mutual distrust. Oh well, as we said, two's company, three's a crowd. The water supply of an area is always a good place to observe animal activity. So it isn't at all surprising that when a puma goes patrolling, his itinerary includes a stroll along the creek. Unaware of the puma, a muskrat pursues its favorite hobby, and that is eating. For all the fancy names by which its fur is sold, such as Hudson seal and river sable, the muskrat is nothing more than an outsized field mouse that's developed into an expert swimmer. The puma moves closer, too close for the muskrat, Watch how he uses his tail as a rudder. The puma is definitely interested. Whether from hunger or just plain curiosity, it's hard to say. This is getting a little too close, so the muskrat makes for the safety of his home. Snug in his own safe harbor, he can stare the puma down, and there's nothing that the puma can do about it. Of all the big cats of the world, the puma is the least averse to water. Where a lion or a tiger would seek to avoid a stream, a puma wades right in. And if the water gets a little deep, well, it's an expert swimmer. If there's a bridge handy, the sure-footed puma takes that route. Claws are valuable tools for climbing and for catching prey. Like all cutting tools, though, from time to time they need sharpening. 
The puma's eyes are extremely sharp, and they catch every movement. It's a beaver, interrupted in his work as a lumberjack. Pumas probably seldom catch beavers, but again, the cat's natural curiosity prompts it to investigate. On land, the puma has the advantage, so the smart beaver takes to the water. This is the beaver's own dam, but the puma is no respecter of property rights. What can a beaver do about a puma that won't leave it alone? Send him on his way. All in all, it's a minor affair. For the puma, an interesting if unproductive encounter. For the beaver, a brief but annoying interruption in his unending toil. So the puma resumes his patrol throughout the length and the breadth of Puma Pass. When winter covers the pass with its thick white blanket, the puma still patrols his territory. His big paws and mighty muscles allow him to traverse the deepest snow fields. Here is remarkable proof that pumas are not wanton killers. I'm sure that deer rarely accept the immediate presence of a puma so casually, but apparently these two somehow sense that they're in no real danger. Young pumas often go adventuring in pairs, as these two are doing. There's a cottontail. The cats move out in different directions. The chase is on, and if you think you know how it will end, well, you just keep your eye on that rabbit. Puma Pass, one animal reigns supreme, yet his is no reign of terror. His dominance is asserted not through savage aggression, but in his virtual immunity to be attacked by any other animal. In this sense, he is indeed the master of Puma Pass. Even though the puma is king of his domain, his story is really one of survival. And from the feel of these claws on this little cat, he's well equipped to take care of himself. Yes, Sir Jim, old Mother Nature takes very good care of them. Not only with those claws, but with these spots for camouflage purposes. Good protection for him. I hope you've enjoyed our story, Puma Pass. I've wanted to tell this story in this particular way for several reasons. For one thing, very few people have ever seen a puma in the wild state. And those who have have generally been hunters. And yet, isn't a live puma a more wonderful and fascinating creature than a dead one? Another reason I chose to tell this story is that I wanted to show you how animals really live. People sometimes get the idea that the wild kingdom is a place filled with savage, wanton killing. This, of course, just isn't so. The puma, for example, kills only to survive. And in a balanced area such as Puma Pass, he presents no threat to the survival of any other species. It's only when man intrudes and upsets this balance that an animal population such as that of Puma Pass fails to thrive according to the age-old pattern of coexistence that governs the rest of the Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom.
Like what you saw? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com.